Hi, my name's Abby Bond. I'm the Executive Director of the Housing Secretariat at the City of Toronto. I'm here to talk to you about um, making a better economic case for housing. Before I jump into that, I just want to make a quick land acknowledgement. I am living and working on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and this area is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. I also want to acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. So the economic case for housing, why bother and how could we do it better? So on the back of widespread housing system failures, we haven't really seen the necessary government intervention, policy or investment to address these failures. For decades, we've been grappling with the question of what happens when people can't afford to buy a home in a city. Now the question facing us, what happens to our cities when people can't afford to rent here? These kinds of housing affordability stresses are widely acknowledged to have implications for economic stability, wealth, growth and productivity. But how well is this really understood? Affordable housing seems to be the number one issue identified by our citizens, so it begs the question, why aren't we doing more? Most of us have a home, uh, we, take for, we take it for granted, we don't acknowledge the daily privilege it provides us, a place to start our day, have a good night's sleep, have a morning coffee, and a safe place to retreat from a difficult world sometimes. But not everybody has this, and in my job in Toronto is to drive forward policies, projects, and investments that strive, forward, strive for everyone to have a home. And because of this, I want to make the best economic case I can, um, as I don't think we will make the connection in the minds of decision makers about why housing policy investment is a good use of government time, energy, and money. Until housing is seen as more than just having a peripheral effect on the economy rather than a foundational part, other investments, policies will be prioritized and opportunities missed. So clearly for me, a shift is needed, something to amplify the sense of urgency that I hear on the street but isn't translated into government programs. What do I want to tell you about Toronto? So it's the fourth largest city in North America. It generates 20% of Canada's GDP. And before COVID, really its success was due to the growth uh, of its financial sector. It's a significant financial hub, a top 10 global financial center. So Toronto's GDP significantly outpaced the national average. So our GDP was 2.4% annually since 2009 compared to a national rate of 1.8. We're a highly competitive um, economy Every major business sector from technology, life sciences, green energy, fashion, digital, music, media, hybrid sectors like uh, medical tech, green tech, food tech. Um, but how, if you scratch the surface, how strong really were we on the back of the success? As I started thinking about the economic case for housing, obviously we start to think about the economic case against inequality. Back in 2014, the OECD report produced a report that basically stated that reducing in income inequality would boost economic growth. And we saw that countries where income inequality was decreasing grow faster than those with rising inequality. The single, single biggest impact on growth is the widening gap between the lower middle class and poor households compared to the rest of society. And this report stated that in terms of the US from 1990 to 2010, it knocked about five percentage points off cumulative GDP per capita and similar effects were seen in other rich countries. So as rising rents and house prices outpace, outpace wage increases, so lower, low and moderate income households are being priced out of our cities or segregated within them. And even higher wage workers are asking whether it's time to leave the region. So the loss of these workers comes potentially with real economic and social costs. Um, so the social costs are often easier to see, for example, like racism. Um, but in Toronto, the economic costs are perhaps not so easy to quantify. 
we see that income polarization is becoming a feature of modern cities. For example, in Toronto, a median income has climbed to just over $70,000 a year, and yet almost 9,000 people are sleeping outside or are homeless every night. And this is a story that's repeated. Um, back in 2019, there was a story about Silicon Valley where it was noted that a record number of well-paying jobs um, had been achieved, the highest average wages worldwide in 2019, and yet homelessness had risen, risen by 17%, and they'd lost almost one-fifth of all teachers in a school district in one year. So I went looking for some local answers, and I came across a really excellent report um, that was re released this year by the Toronto Board of Trade in partnership with Wood Green. This report states categorically that in terms of housing, Toronto's continued economic growth depends on finding an answer to this urgent, increasingly urgent problem before it's too late. And it identifies governments, employers, citizens, all coming together to address this issue. It clearly links diversity and economic growth. It has a number of great statistics in it about how the population of Toronto grew 10 times faster than the number of rental units in 2018, how we have a vacancy rate of less than 1.5%, how um, we, between 2016 and 2019, we saw over 300,000 jobs created, but only 100,000 homes. Only 2% of homes approved in the last five years have been affordable. Um, and in 2017 to 2018, 50,000 people moved out of the Toronto area to other parts of the province. So we're a global magnet for tech and innovation sector. And yet, if we're going to respond to this, we need to provide a full spectrum of housing options that meet the needs, both of these high-end tech workers, but also all the spin-off jobs that are likely to be created. The report's really interesting because it talks about the, um, or identifies the need for engagement with um, actual employers in terms of this discussion. And for me, it was a reminder because um, it hasn't really, employer, employers haven't really been a feature of housing policy in the last number of years. And yet when I th think back to um, kind of some of the housing history in the UK, there were many initial employer efforts like Joseph Roundtree with the housing trust that now owns 2,500 homes. There was the Bourneville Village built by Cadbury's. There was Port Sunlight built by the Lever Brothers, now Unilever. It seemed that this idea of healthily housed employees meant productive employees um, has been lost somewhere in, in history and hasn't really been a feature of housing policy. It seems that what we're facing is a rapid growth of tech sector jobs, which could contribute to rising incomes and wealth, but at the same time will likely result for us in rises in homelessness, increasing inequality, and a break on, which in turn acts as a break on economic growth. And you've seen some of the larger employee, employers re-engage around this. There seems to be a recognition of this connection. In 2019, you saw Google um, contribute or state that they would contribute a billion dollars towards kind of a housing pledge and then not to be outdone, Apple then followed with $2.5 billion. It seems to be that high rents and housing prices um, lead to restricted spending on other activities, uh, other economic activities instead of what they, because they're spending money on housing costs basically. Um, there's a report from 2016 that estimated if New York City rents had increased at inflation since 2010, $7 billion more would have been spent in the broader economy. This report then goes on to talk about how housing affects the economy through corporate retention and expansion, access to talent, education and child development, access to opportunity, community development, and it basically ends by saying that there's a need for action to implement the house, City of Toronto's housing plan, Ontario's housing plan, and the federal government's national housing strategy as quickly as possible. And it didn't even get into really construction jobs and other, and housing as an other kind of economic multiplier. It didn't really talk about skilled work or training opportunities. And like a good cliffhanger, it said that a future report would cover the costs of inaction, calculating the economic and social cost. 
So I wonder what information we need to collect that shows that in the Toronto region, if rising health prices have limited the movement of labour, and perhaps we could see how pockets of housing wealth have affected or prevented the, that movement and, of, and the mixing of people with different incomes. We're, you know, this is really important if we understand correctly that cities like Toronto rely on the coming together of talent, jobs and investment. So in Toronto, it seems that the commodification of housing has likely meant that owning a home is more and a more important driver of your wealth than your job. It isn't just a place to live for many, but a wealth generator, a retirement nest egg, but also a driver of inequality. And therefore, it presents a limit on economic growth. And I want to see this made real by seeing the Toronto-based evidence. And I don't have access to it currently in a coherent form. So a few conclusions. What about our post-COVID economy? Like they say in the small print often, past performance is not necessarily an indicator of future performance. Post-COVID, the city and the country will have to claw back economic success with millions unemployed and defaults on residential and commercial mortgages and second and third waves potentially of COVID is likely to be a long road. And Canada won't back, bounce back unless Toronto does. But as we shift to a recovery mode, a renewed focus on housing policy interventions and investments could create the perfect environment for us to recover into a more equal society. We just need to persuade decision makers that it's both possible and worth it. So rather than just clapping our key workers every night at seven o'clock, we could actually make sure that they can afford to live in our cities. We could consider every potential amplifier and advantage that we can. And housing is, in my opinion, an untapped amplifier. And somewhere in all of this, we might actually strengthen our economic case to better fund our cities. Thank you for listening.